state region like the Great Lakes or a five state region like the Chesapeake Bay. Um, but I've seen it also, you know, but it is, it is a challenge um, and it is one of the things that we've seen as um, something that um, other coalitions we've been involved with had to, deal, had to grapple with. Um, I also think focusing on implementation is a good place for any coalition to be, um, especially in regions that have lots of plans. And I've been impressed, again, with the focus of this coalition or to be focused, to really try to say, we've got enough planning, we know what needs to be done, and now it's, to, and now it's time to get some resources in order to accomplish our goals. I think that's also very, very important because we can get lost in a lot of the planning processes um, and not actually achieve the successful restoration we're looking for, and it's that successful restoration that's going to allow you, like I said, to tell those stories to decision makers like the Carolyn Maloney's and the Gerald Nadler's who will need to be able to convince their partners up on Capitol Hill of why it's important to be investing limited federal dollars in this region. Um, and I also want to su suggest that it's um, really important to have um, support from the funding community, and I think it's great that Kaplan is is investing a lot of resources um, because I know in the Great Lakes Coalition we did have one funder at the beginning invest a significant amount of resources. The Weggie Foundation out of Michigan invested five million dollars over five years um, to really get the coalition up and running. Um, and, 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 and what that allowed the coalition to do was also to um, you know, establish a presence in Washington as well as really build educational capacity within the region so not only were we doing the work in Washington, but we were also um, engaging the public, what you were talking about, writing those letters to the editor, or having those press conferences, or getting those action alerts out, so people are communicating with their decision makers. Um, and that was very, very important. And it was really helpful to have a strong support from the funding community, like the Weggie Foundation, or the Joyce Foundation in Chicago, to really support that work. So I really applaud um, what you've done in terms of supporting this, but I think that's also a very key component to um, really getting this initiative um, and this coalition off the ground. Well, let me uh, just uh, briefly add to that. We've been in RPA, we've been involved in a couple of these large landscape coalitions, both uh, in the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut Highlands, in the passage of the Highlands Conservation Act, and I saw Robin Kreisberg somewhere here on Long Island Sound Stewardship System Act, um, so, uh, which is also part of the region. Um, but, uh, and I think to me the big lesson there, in addition to the uh, great words that Chad said, uh, add two other things, uh, or maybe one thing, and that's really the idea of a congressional champion. And because you really need to find that one or two or maybe four uh, individuals uh, down in Washington who are really going to take this to heart and make and see their success as your success. And uh, and what's you know, and, and I think. You know, I know we saw, you know, Roland through his, uh, you know, artfulness as, and the rest of the team at WA got a bunch of potential champions here. And I think, uh, you know, I think the courting has to start. And, you know, I think a big, a big factor in that is really going to be the voices of all of you here in the room. Because uh, us here at the table, we're kind of, you know, they expect to see us. And what they might not expect is to see all of us talking about the same thing, and that's really what's going to be critical. So I think, you know, one of the maybe homework assignments or, or something for the Q&A would be, you know, thinking about your representative down in D.C. And, and what they're interested in and what they might bring to the table and whether they might be willing to be a champion, uh, not just for your project, but for the coalition as a whole. It just one, one quick thing to add is basically the cost of doing restoration here is significantly, I'd say, several orders of magnitude greater than in other places, including, I'd say, the Great Lakes and certainly Chesapeake Bay. I mean, we've got a lit, litany and legacy of contamination plumes that, you know, from the Passaic River, the Hudson River, um, and the harbor itself, and the, you know, the, both the Port Authority, New York City DEP, and New Jersey DEP have, um, have done you know, fairly good job at, at starting, you know, the process and remediating a lot of these sites. But for us to restore an acre here, if, especially if you have contaminated soil, um, you know, or basically, and we heard about relative sea level rise, we're experiencing that also, and there are technologies that help to support and to, um, you know, to, to stop the waking and, you know, the elevated sea level rise. You know, which, which isn't a, a great way to do it, but there are technologies in place that are going to end up costing you more 
in order to get larger acreage, um, you know, wetlands, for instance, restored. So that needs to be in place. And then just finally, there is, you know, again, I've said this twice already, there's a great plan out there. And I think it's a matter of just getting the dedicated funding and the fact that, you know, that Roland did such a remarkable job in attracting, you know, along with the coalition of Alex Brash and the company, um, the elected public officials here is, is a remarkable feat and, and there's great interest and we just need to stay on top of that. Thanks. Um, so we're going to open this up because as you've heard a number of people say, this is coalition needs to be very broad and very deep to have success. So we'd like to hear from you. Um, uh, first, I want to point out Courtney, Courtney and Darcy from NPCA and MWA, who first of all have passed around a, a sign-up sheet if you want to um, get information and be on the email list for the coalition. So if you can look for that if you want to put your name on it. And then, um, are we doing cards or? Cards. Okay. Okay, I'll just start with this. Um, how is this coalition different from prior harbor estuary restoration efforts? We're angry. <laughs> it's basically, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, there were some great efforts and they're certainly like remarkable um, champions that, you know, I had the privilege of working in, you know, in the 90s and early 200s, 2000s, 2000s. Um, I, I think what, you know, what it is is that we've basically, there's a plan out there that's absolutely terrific. If you put our plan next to the, the Great Lakes plan, and if you put the Harbors plan next to the Chesapeake plan and some of the others that are getting funded, including Long Island Sound, there's a lot of detail, you know, that, that some of those plans that have dedicated funding sources don't have. And I think it's, it's about time that, um, that we, we reach the threshold. We can't gather that much, you know, Dennis is standing right in front of me. We can always gather more information. But, um, <laughs> but we've gathered a lot of information, and I think the time is now to catalyze and to mobilize, and we really do need funding, and, you know, it's, we can't do any more. So join us. Mark. Um, two similar questions here about funding mechanisms. Beyond lobbying for federal dollars and resources, has the coalition explored more innovative funding mechanisms? And if so, what kind? And then this a question lists some of those potential sources. Um, slightly different category. Uh, natural resource damages, fines and penalties, um, both federal and state mitigation projects, contributions from Fortune 100 companies. How might the coalition position itself to get these resources? So, if if the group has done any thinking about that, you know, outside of this room or off the top of your heads right now. Well, uh, I guess the short answer is no. Uh, um, so, but I think, you know, at least not as a coalition. I think we've all sort of thought about it. But I think it's important to think about the, you know, again, I think the coalition is really aimed at the idea of federal funding, whether it's through. Uh, appropriations through existing government programs and supporting those or through a new authorization as was done with the Long Island Sound Stewardship Act or the Highlands Conservation Act which were specific new authorities that allowed Congress to fund conservation work. Um, I think though what's what's really important and, I, and again a lot of folks in this room are way smarter than I am about this um, you know most of these projects when the federal money comes it does require matching money and that matching money is, could come from any number of sources. And I think one of the promises of going down to DC and presenting a unified front um, and coming up with a specific uh, ask uh, is that I think it's gonna help focus some funding here at home as well, whether, and, and maybe attract some more innovative sources of money. Because again, I think if Washington puts up some money, we know we'll have to match it at some level. So I, I think that that's something certainly that's that's in the back of our minds, not not in front. So. Yeah, and I think um, what I referred to before is funding through serendipity has basically been a hallmark of the harbor here. There's remarkable individuals here. The Natural Resources Damages Initiatives of both states. 
I know when I worked for New Jersey DEP, there were like 3,000 cases brought out. There were several hundreds of millions of dollars that went towards restoration that have been executed. Some um, in the iterative phase at Liberty State Park and then at Lincoln Park, a fabulous wetland restoration in New York City. Um, the whole Arthur Kill Initiative to restore through natural resources damages in a $15 million settlement in 1990 um, by Exxon and then a couple of subsequent ones. Um, Environmental Protection Fund in the state really helped to catalyze and, um, and to restore several acres you know, in Jamaica Bay. Mike Feller's here. He basically um, um, is responsible for a couple of hundred acres restored in um, at Marine Park alone. And Alex Brash has been a huge champion of um, of the Jamaica Bay restorations of New York City DEP has um, taken the lead on um, and in, in several of those restorations. But it's all just basically a drop in the bucket at this point, and it's not, you can't depend upon those funding sources. And it, it's by serendipity. So I think um, dedicated funding really makes a difference. No, I definitely agree with everything that was said, but one of the th things that was just that just crossed my mind as we are talking about funding is, um, first of all, there's a lot of different funding sources in Washington that you could go after, including EPA money or Army Corps money, or um, I don't know if you can find some Farm Bill money up here. I don't know if you, can, if you have any, anything around here. Some people do find Farm Bill money for urban areas, so um, maybe you can be creative. Um, but one of the things that was mentioned is that you know most of the federal programs do require a match, and I heard a couple of times mentioned that this is a coalition that's going to go after federal money, but that federal money is going to require some sort of match from a non-federal sponsor. And so one of the things you may want to consider doing is is pushing your state and, and continuing to push your, your locals or, or your non-governmental folks to be able to bring forward that non-federal match, because if you don't have the match, it doesn't matter how much federal money you get because you're just not going to be able to use it because there's not going to be anything to apply it towards because you won't be able to meet the requirements. So that might be something for the coalition to consider in the future. Uh, okay, a couple of questions about very specific things. What will the coalition do about CSOs? And um, how would the members of the coalition propose to address elevated sea level rise? What practical solutions are there to keep sea level New York City from catastrophic flooding? I'll, I'll uh, tackle a, a CSO one, maybe a little bit easier. I know there's been a lot of discussions. One of our six goals is addressing, as, as folks know, CSO refers to, uh, or may know, uh, combined sewer overflow. Uh, which is what happens when too much rainwater enters our sewage system. Um, one of the things in, in thinking about this, uh, New York City DEP has launched uh, uh, through its green infrastructure plan and the stormwater management plan, a lot of great pilot programs aimed at reducing CSO inputs uh, through pilot projects and thinking about how those apply in different areas of the city. Um, there hasn't, uh, to my knowledge, and, uh, been sort of a similar comprehensive effort in New Jersey, where there's not, you know, it's, you know, there's many more municipalities, many more water authorities, uh, and uh, it's a more diffuse problem. I can say that. Um, and one of the things that the coalition could explore would be maybe uh, helping to galvanize an effort through federal money to help New Jersey uh, tackle these questions. Because certainly, in terms of uh, the impact on the harbor, it's just as much for New Jersey, if not as New York City, and. And perhaps we can use the coalition efforts and the fact that New York City has moved ahead aggressively on this to help push New Jersey forward. Yeah. I would also say that uh, Plan YC has been looking at investment in CSO infrastructure through DEP and also has been developing sea level rise focus groups around the city to begin to develop a plan around around those issues. So I think um, Plan YC has been the primary vehicle for thinking about sea level rise so far. Um, I, I think sort of what we're hearing also is that you know the coalition, because of all the plans that are out there, um, there there is some low hanging fruit. And part of the first one of the first steps they're going to be taking is is identifying what that low hanging fruit is and. Um, so it's a little hard to talk sometimes very specifically about these things. The next question is, is about the Great Waters Coalition. The first one is, 
what does designation as a great water mean? And then somewhat related, two questions about um, thinking in terms of an estuary. One is about Congressman Tonko who was here earlier and talked about um, his upriver district and Chris Ward's mentioned a one estuary initiative. And along the same lines, um, why not a Hudson River estuary? Um, great waters like Puget Sound, the Great Lakes, et cetera, are defined by an estuary. Well, I'll try to address what does the Great Waters designation mean. The Great Waters Coalition was started about a year ago, I guess it was December of 2009. We, we came together with nine, eight water bodies, and then a ninth was joined when Lake Champlain was added. And um, throughout a process, it was we needed to determine how to answer that very question. And what we came up with was a set of guidelines for the Coalition's Steering Committee to use in considering petitions from water bodies around the country to what exactly, what defines the great water. And generally what defines a great water includes a number of different things. The, 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 the three primary ones are, you know, is it significant in geographic scope? Um, does it have a comprehensive plan? And, is, in, in, and what is its contribution to the nation? Um, some of that, there's a little bit of subjectivity in there, but I think in general we try to develop um, the criteria in a way that makes um, the designation of great water as objective as possible. And I think what you have here in this area is um, the harbor is of significant geographic scope. It includes millions of people that um, depend on the health of the water quality, the, the health of the water and the resources. Um, have a number of plans that were already mentioned, um, and I just went blank on the third thing that I talked about. So, um, so it was decided by the steering committee that yes, indeed, this is um, New York, New Jersey Harbor is um, is is a great water um, as defined by the Great Waters Coalition, and we were very pleased that um, the harbor um, did petition because it's a it's a great addition to the coalition. Um, whose mission really is to try and advance the idea that all of our great waters, whether or not they're the Puget, Puget Sound or San Francisco Bay, the Great Lakes, coastal Louisiana, Everglades, Colorado River, Rio Grande, Ohio River, Missouri River, whatever it is, um, that it's rest, their restoration needs to be a national priority. And that's really the driving force behind the Great Waters Coalition is to have all of these various great water bodies um, come together to really try to um, basically nationalize restoration um, and push it up the ladder of priorities um, in Washington. We feel that we can, working together, much like you're trying to do at the local level, we feel working at the national level together as restoration as a restoration community um, make restoration work a national priority so all of our, all of our efforts um, can get the funding that they need um, and um, in, in difficult um, fiscal times. Um, would one of you like to speak to the question about um, the larger estuary? The, and it, I guess it really is about the, the boundaries that this coalition has decided to focus on. Well, I think, you know, one of the things, obviously, with any coalition, one of the difficulties is, is defining yourself. One of the difficulties, one of the challenges is defining yourself. And I think uh, for us as a group, one of the ways uh, we've sought to define ourselves or brand the, the, the effort is through a focus on urban waters and a focus on, on um, the, you know, the intense urbanity of the New York, New Jersey Harbor. And while there's a certainly wonderful places upriver, uh, up, up to, the, to the reaches, you know, uh, of the Hudson River. Um, building that coalition that was meaningful uh, in a way that, that Congress people could get instantly uh, really meant that we had to focus on, on, again, the very urban core of the New York, New Jersey harbor, both New York City and, and, and the urban parts of New Jersey. I think, um, you know, like anything, you know, once you start pulling that first thread, um, it gets more difficult, you know, if we went up river, you know, what's wrong with the Raritan? You know, what's wrong with the Hackensack River and all the other great rivers in New Jersey? And so, uh, you know, we wanted to focus on, on this part of the Hudson River estuary. Thank you. 
Um, so we have a few more questions. We'll try to get to most of them. Um, this one is about the fact that there are many examples of successful pilot programs and projects that have failed to be scaled up or to change the way that agencies operate. Will the coalition also focus on how to make innovation take hold in cautious bureaucracies? Yes. 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 <laughs> well, thank you, Maria. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just make a comment there, Laura? Yes. Um, the Mayor's New Waterfront Advisory uh, Committee, which um, a no number of members of uh, this group and the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance sit on, there's a, a unit called Infrastructure Permitting and something else. And it's really looking at streamlining um, access to regulation, access to information, um, working on permitting and, and making sure that that information um, is transparent and easily accessible. So that work has really just started over the last, I guess, four months and, and continues. And we hope that it will certainly make um, access to, to this information and regulation and permitting um, a lot easier for us all to be able to, um, to take part in. I think the most creative and innovative thing we can do is leverage and hemorrhage funds. Um, there's basically we're now um, within New York State SANS an environmental protection fund, which I think is absolutely crucial. In New Jersey, the vision to um, you know to reinstitute a Green Acres program has certainly helped to um, you know to mobilize and to um, to begin support of some of the urban programs that we're seeing across the across the and across the river over there. Um, <laughs> but anyway, looking at natural resources damages funds and leveraging that with with um, with programs that the state would support through bond initiatives, I think is crucial. And then basically adding adding on a dedicated um, source of funding. And certainly, there's always the not-for-profit sector. And I know at the Trust for Public Land, we're looking at philanthropic fundraising for the first time, you know, in a meaningful way, we're hoping to come to the table also, but matches rock. Thanks. One more sort of nuts and bolts question, and then we have a few about how you can get involved in this, which we'll cover at the very end. So, what do you consider the pros and cons of mitigation banking? The, this, is, this is something that really angers me. The real cost of doing business is, um, is actually looking at, and, and I've worked with some mitigation banks, it, it costs us significantly more to do an acre of wetland restoration. So if we do mitigation banking, and, and, the, you know, and, and for those colleagues in the room who have actually done um, on the ground restoration, it runs the gamut from anywhere from 200 to 300,000 an acre to 1.1 million an acre. And a lot of that has to do with removal of contaminated soils for restoration, and I think that if if um, a mitigation bank can accurately reflect the real cost of doing restoration in the harbor, it's an incredibly useful tool. If it's three hundred or four hundred dollars an acre or a thousand dollars an acre, it's not going to advance the no net loss you know goal of so many of us um, you know on the coalition. And I think we have to look realistically at the act, at the actual cost of doing restoration. Okay, the, the, we have three questions here that are sort of related about how to get involved. One is, how do we get the public to care and to tell their elected officials? What's the relationship between this coalition and the Harbor Caucus, and how do I get involved? Um, and how do we join? So if you guys want to take the Harbor Caucus coalition relationship and a little bit about getting elected officials interested, and maybe use that as an opportunity to talk a little bit about so far, how the governance of the coalition is working and what your thinking is at the moment in terms of how to engage more people in um, either an informal or formal way. Uh, I'll, I'll tackle the first of those questions. Uh, really, the idea of the caucus uh, in, is really uh, the members of Congress uh, would be the members of the caucus. and. Uh, I know in Long Island Sound, uh, they've had terrific leadership from a series of Congress people who have made it their business to secure funding from Long Island Sound. And really, uh, the effort of the coalition uh, is really to find those congressional leaders 
uh, to get them to commit uh, to asking their colleagues to join with them in specific funding efforts, whether it's specific appropriations or, or long, long term, uh, a broad authorization, a new authorization. Uh, so that's kind of the specific relationship uh, that we're trying to build. I mean, in terms of getting folks involved, and folks might want to add to this, but you know, obviously being on the boat here and uh, letting MWA know that you want to be part of it is really the first step. Uh, we don't envision this, you know, while we're starting with a small group, the idea is that that's really the seed that's going to grow uh, a broad scale movement. And, and in order to be successful, you know, at the end of the day, all politics are local. So uh, for those congressional leaders, they're going to want to hear from sort of professional advocates, uh, but they're also going to want to hear from the agencies. They're going to want to hear from uh, local neighborhood groups. They're going to want to hear from a bunch of folks uh, that think this is a good idea. Um, so I think that's really that's really the goal of this effort today. Certainly we have to develop a strong set of communication goals and a communications network. Um, and we hope again to, to start with the base of you all who are here. We know that there's been so much enthusiasm around local projects and we need that enthusiasm to really bolster and be a foundation for, for what we're doing here at the coalition. So we're going to be developing a series of, of outreach efforts and communication efforts to ensure that all of our voices can be heard in this process and that we can all be a part of it. Okay, and I just want to say one final word a little bit. There was one question that um, I neglected to ask, and that is how long is the coalition going to be in place? So I'll, I'll just take that from a funder's point of view. So the J.M. Kaplan Fund is supporting this work for two years. Um, Rockefeller Brothers Fund is also supporting the, the coalition for two years. I think um, the druthers of the group would be to have a five-year funding plan in place based on the Great Lakes example and they will be actively fundraising but I think I, I would make the point to this group that as the coalition moves forward and these um, local stories come out and their specific projects or organizing efforts that would really help move this along that's going to be of interest to other private funders who didn't necessarily couldn't necessarily fund the the larger um, the big picture piece of this so I think this is a long-term effort and hopefully it will go on as long as it needs to and hopefully that will be approximately five years. So um, thank you very much for your, um, your time and listening and thanks to the panelists for a great session. Well, just hold, hold your seat for one second and uh, our dredge panel is finishing up upstairs. And if you could see, I've, uh, I've had the privilege of being able to bounce back and forth. If you could imagine a room exactly this size with such rapt attention about the subject of dredge material, you would not believe it, but it's true. <laughs> Almost like they were watching some uh, wonderful movie. There's <laughs> hanging on every word. So anyway, uh, give me uh, two seconds and we're gonna make a couple of logistic amount announcements and then on to the next and final phase of the floating follow. -up. How are people enjoying the floating follow up? Wasn't yeah. <laughs> sure this was a good idea, but it seems pretty good so far, eh? All right, so uh, hold, hold tight, please. So talk amongst yourselves. Here, one minute early, so. Thank you. 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 Thank you.